afternoon's webinar series, and thank you so much for tuning in. We are pleased to have you join us for the Southeast Ocean and Coastal Acidification Network State of the Science webinar series. The title of today's presentation is Leveraging the IUS Regional Associations to Achieve Ocean Acidification Program Goals, the SECORA and OAP Partnership in the South Atlantic Bight, including discussions of SOCAN. In short, the series lays a foundation for state of the ocean acidification science in the Southeast region. This particular webinar, along with others in the series, int are intended to create a dialogue among scientists to identify what we know, what we don't know, and what research in other regions of the U.S. can be applied to better understand ocean acidification and its impacts in the southeastern United States. With awareness of and access to the research and its applications and uses, Webinar participants will be able to collaborate to better understand and adapt to ocean acidification moving forward. I'm Paula Keener, a marine biologist and director of education programs with NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research and a member of the SOCAN Steering Committee, and I'll be facilitating today's session for you on behalf of the SOCAN Steering Committee. Jennifer Minnett Bennett Mintz is the Education and Outreach Coordinator for NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program. And Jennifer is also on the line and she'll be helping to answer your questions and facilitating the technical um, components of today's webinar. During the presentation, attendees will be in listen-only mode. You're welcome to type questions related to the technical issues or questions for the presenter into the GoToWebinar panel that should be appearing on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll be monitoring the incoming questions during the webinar and we will respond to them or pose them to our speaker after the webinar. We are also recording this session, and the video recording and the PDF will be, uh, of the presentation will be available on the SOCAN website within the next few days. So today, we are very fortunate to have uh, Libby Jewett and Deborah Hernandez joining us for the presentation. And Dr. Libby Jewett became the founding director of the NOAA Ocean Acidification program in 2011, and she's been busy ever since, building and organizing and steering that particular program and its enterprise. As a founding member of the NOAA Ocean Acidification Steering Committee, which was first convened in 2007, Libby co-led NOAA-wide meetings of scientists and policymakers to conceive and develop NOAA's first comprehensive ocean acidification research plan. She chairs the Ocean Acidification Interagency Working Group which falls under the Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology, where she has helped develop an ocean acidification strategic research plan for the nation. Libby is co-chair of the Executive Council of the newly formed Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. And prior to becoming director of the program, she directed the only two national competitive hypoxia research funding programs as program manager for the Center of Sponsored Coastal Ocean Research and NOAA's National Ocean Service. Libby earned her PhD in biology with a focus on marine ecology at the University of Maryland, a Master of Public Policy at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, and a BA at Yale. Deborah Hernandez currently serves as its Executive Director of the Southeast Coastal Ocean Observing Regional Association, or SECORA. And SECORA is just one of 11 regional partners in the U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System and is a nonprofit operating in the, in the states of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. SECORA's mission is to coalesce the efforts of multiple observing interests and deliver user-defined products that save lives, conserve the coastal and marine environment, and support the economic, the economic vitality of our coastal regions. Deborah has over 25 years of experience in coastal and ocean management and policy. Her professional interests include improving the linkages between scientists and decision makers, and facilitating discussions of public policy issues related to the coast and environment. She recently served on the National Academy's Ocean Studies Board and the Ocean Research and Research Resources Advisory Panel, and currently serves on the South Carolina Sea Grant Consortium Program Advisory Board, as well as Vice Chair of the IUS Association. Deb graduated from Clemson University with a master's degree in civil engineering and was a licensed professional engineer for many years. Libby's going to begin our presentation for us this afternoon during the webinar series. So, Libby, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, I'm here. I'm going to make sure. All right. So, 
So can you see my screen, Paula? Paula, are you on? Can you? Yes, yes, everyone okay. can see your screen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just want to check before I get going. I don't want to be talking into the ether. Okay, so um, first of all, I want to, I'm going to go for about 20 minutes and then turn it over to Deborah, and hopefully I'll uh, get through most of what I've put together for you all. Um, and, and thank you so much, Paula, for that great introduction. Um, I'm excited uh, to have this opportunity to present on the partnership that the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program, which is a relatively new NOAA entity that um, was put together, started in 2011, but that our program has together with the Integrated Ocean Observing System, or IUS, um, we've developed an incredibly strong partnership, uh, which I think helps both of our programs to more efficiently and effectively meet um, our missions uh, as related to broadening our understanding of ocean acidification in all of uh, U.S. coastal waters. So I'm going to do a, a present on OAP's general approach and point out along the way all the intersections and synergies that we have um, that makes both of our approaches stronger. So um, the first slide here, I actually is a um, model projections put together by Jim Orr on the changing aragonite saturation state of our world's surface oceans, and uh, this is rather sobering information. You know, basically showing, and I'm not going to give you the chemistry slide. Um, I know that a number of you have tuned in to prior webinars. You understand what ocean acidification science is about and the chemical changes that are happening in our waters. But this is to show that, you know, no, no part of our oceans is immune from uh, being affected. And uh, the sooner impacts are happening in our polar oceans, but they're going to be happening in all of our oceans eventually. And one thing to note here is that um, although it looks like we have resolution all the way up to our coasts, um, in most cases, we actually don't have that. And so this next slide, which is focusing in on the southeast region, is actually was highlighted in the webinar that Rick Wanikoff gave a number of maybe a month or so ago. Um, and this is from a paper that um, he and colleagues recently published. And this is actually showing the differential and in aragonite saturation state. And aragonite is the, um, a measure of uh, the concentration of calcium carbonate um, in mineral form in our waters. And that's important because uh, many shell building organisms, or all shell building organisms, rely on um, being able to pull um, calcium carbonate or calcium and carbonate out of water in order to build their shells. And so as the um, saturation state is diminished, uh, which is happening over time, it becomes more difficult for them to do that. And um, this slide, which is actually showing the difference between um, saturation state in our surface waters um, between two cruises that happen along the east coast and in the Gulf. And um, there's interesting in that the dark blue is showing um, a negative change, quite a significant negative change um, in aragonite saturation state in the southeast. And it's greater than what we would have predicted if we were just looking at the effect of atmospheric CO2. So as you've seen in prior webinars, um, as you get to the coast, it gets more complicated. And there's more and more in here that we need to understand about that, what is complicated about that and what are the ramifications for our marine resources, which gets us to this. Um, these are a range of um, primarily calcifying organisms that have very productive commercial fisheries associated with them um, in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic regions and, and Southeast. And we need to understand more about how ocean acidification is going to play out for them. And so this is just quick 
you know, abundance distribution, not, abund not abundance, but distribution maps of the various some species um, that are potentially going to be affected. Of course, the eastern oyster is one, and oyster, the, a number of different species of oyster have actually received uh, probably um, more research energy than other species, and we know um, that there's potentially a threshold um, in aragonite saturation state whereby if it drops below that, their larvae are potentially imperiled. So the eastern oyster is one species that is a, a, a primary focus of our work. Um, this is just a distribution of cold water corals from the USGS. Uh, we know much less about what the potential ramifications are for them, and there actually is another webinar if you go into the series of SOCAN webinars that, that actually talks about cold water corals and what we do, do and do not know. Um, brown shrimp, another very important fishery along our east coast and into the Gulf, um, and, and actually even less is understood about them. There are num a few papers um, looking at what uh, ramifications, uh, declining saturation state uh, might have, but but relatively little information, so we need to do some investment there. Um, and then finally, just wanted to point out that harmful algal blooms, which are definitely a focus along our east coast, and here is showing the very syndromes related to various harmful algal bloom species, um, and the intersection or, or effect of ocean acidification on HABs and all of these different types of HABs is relatively unknown. There's some, some work happening in some places which indicates that some species may actually become more toxic as a, as a consequence of um, ocean acidification, so we definitely need to understand more about that. Um, this was a paper that actually Rick Wanikoff also um, highlighted, and we may try and get them to come in and do a separate entire webinar on this. Um, but this paper, which came out in Nature Climate Change, was actually um, looking at uh, the, the vulnerability of coastal communities to um, ocean acidification effects, focusing specifically on um, shell fisheries uh, along our coasts, and uh, the, the reddish colors are indicating um, varying levels of vulnerability as related to um, dependence on those shell fisheries and um, other factors that uh, would help the, the, those communities adapt in the event that those fisheries are affected. Um, and then the, the blue, the purple is actually when um, the surface waters will become corrosive to the larvae, uh, particularly of oysters, which we understand fairly well. And so along our east coast, you can see that we're not predicting that the surface waters will reach that, that critical threshold until, you know, perhaps the end of the century, um, but there are other mini, there are other um, amplifying effects like uh, river runoff and um, eutrophication, which amplify acidification, and you can see that is definitely going to be an issue in the southeast. Um, and also, you know, as you saw in that graphic that I showed before of the differential between the cruises, um, the the effects are um, perhaps are appear to be amplified already. And so the more we understand about this, the more we can provide those communities with a, a heads up about what's to come. So what kind of structure exists um, to respond? Uh, the Federal Ocean Education Research and Monitoring Act was passed in 2009. It set up an um, a interagency working group, which I chair with, with a number of agencies, NOAA, NSF, NASA, EPA, Department of State, USDA, Department of Energy, USGS, Fish and Wildlife, BOEM. National Park Service, so we're all coordinating our response and also set up the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program, um, and which has a whole series of things that we're supposed to do. Um, but our guiding documents for both the interagency working group, but also, but in, in our case for NOAA, are these two plans, which you can um, access online, the Strategic Plan for Federal Research and Monitoring of OA, 
and the NOAA OA um, research plan. And I will say in the NOAA plan, we actually have, it's divided in chapters, and each chapter focuses on a region, and we have uh, specific information in there about how we're approaching the southeast and the Gulf. And so the NOAA OA program works along these um, basic seven themes, um, monitoring the chemistry, doing biological impacts work, developing new technologies, both for monitoring and for the biological work, uh, data management, modeling and forecasting, um, de development of adaptation strategies, and education and outreach. And I would say on almost all of those, um, we are partnering in some way with the IUS regional associations, of which Socora is the one from the southeast that Deborah um, is in charge of. So um, quickly, in terms of monitoring oceans, this is just a close-up of the east coast. And want to note that we have a number of moorings along our east coast, three or really two, I guess, um, in the, particularly in the southeast region, one on Gray's Reef and one at Chica Rocks and the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Um, so we have moorings which get at the, the temporal variability of ocean acidification changes. Um, but we also have the east, east Coast OA Cruise which is out right now, and that, that little yellow dot um, indicates uh, where, approximately where the RV Gunter, which is the ship that's, um, that's doing the work, uh, or the ship's not doing the work. The scientists are doing the work, but they're on that ship, and they're right out there right now. Um, and this is just, next slide is to remind us that, um, that these cruises, and so now this cruise that's out right now is the, the third in a series of three cruises, the first being in 2007, that was GOMEC 1, um, the second was GOMEC 2 in 2012, and now we're having the East Coast part of that because we split the East and the Gulf um, happening right now, and so we can get further resolution as to um, how, how much more different um, the saturation state is in comparison to those other two years. And the Gulf of Mexico cruise will be happening in 2017. So that's just to note why those cruises are important. And we're actually um, leveraging and funding our PIs for that cruise through um, the regional associations of IUS. So that, again, you know, helps us to leverage all the IUS assets uh, for that work. In addition, I want to say in the southeast, um, and that particularly relevant to that Chica Rocks mooring, um, we, we actually partner with the Coral Reef Conservation Program to look at a whole suite of, an, of um, coral reef health um, indicators that are related to um, or, or could be affected by ocean acidification. So I just wanted to note that as part of our monitoring portfolio. Um, we also invest in technology development. Um, in particular, we're, we're helping, working with private companies to outfit um, autonomous vehicles to do ocean acidification observing. So here you see the carbon wave glider and the newest um, one, which is the sail drone, which actually um, carries a pretty large payload of sensors. Um, and then in addition, um, we actually had an, a request for proposals jointly with IUS and IUS and, and the ocean acidification program are jointly funding a project on the West Coast and the project on the East Coast to uh, further refine and develop new technologies that will be particularly useful for um, the shellfish industry as they um, adapt to corrosive conditions. And as you know, Oregon and, and Washington have already been experiencing that. Um, biological impacts, this is probably the one theme in which we don't work as closely with IUS. Um, but I just want to note that because it's an important part of the OAP portfolio, uh, we do have a number of fisheries labs and also um, universities that we fund to do um, ocean acidification impacts uh, research. Um, this is noting a couple of the different labs um, that we work with. And uh, I do want to note that, that we don't have um, as strong an effort uh, looking at impacts on biological on species uh, in the southeast, although I think that will be an area of growth. Um, for instance, looking at effects on 
on shrimp and on different corals that are important for the southeast um, and on finfish. Uh, so, so it's always good to have uh, a growth area. <laughs> um, and hopefully our resources will grow and allow us to do that. In terms of um, modeling and forecasts, so uh, we have some, we've been able to expand our modeling efforts in the past year, um, with, particularly with the increase in funding that the OAP received in 2015. Um, so this is just actually um, a forecast system that is being put together on the West Coast and the Pacific Northwest. Um, that the Ocean Specification Program also contributes. I'm sure, I'm sure that IU's um, assets are somehow um, involved in this forecast as well. Um, in addition, uh, we have a couple of new modeling efforts on the East Coast that we're rolling out this year, one that's um, uh, led by PIs at AOML and the Cooperative Institute, CMIS. Um, in addition, uh, we will soon be announcing information about a new modeling project in the Chesapeake Bay, so um, stay tuned for those. Um, in terms of data management, this is also another area in which um, IUS is really leading um, in terms of serving ocean acidification data. Uh, they, the NANUS, which is the regional association of IUS on the west, on, in the Pacific Northwest, um, was uh, given resources or allowed to develop this uh, specific OA portal um, in which they highlight the assets. So what you see there are the assets that are um, collecting ocean specification re relevant information. Uh, and a number of those, I think those are kind of the people icons. These guys, I don't know if those are people, I guess, um, are, are actual hatchery sites, I believe. Um, and those are also involved um, in providing information for the broader community. And uh, when you uh, mouse over any one of those, you can actually get a direct view in real time of the saturation state of waters um, relevant to whatever that mooring is. And I think we uh, ideally would like to see uh, this same effort replicated um, for the other uh, regional association, so Socorro might be next. Um, next, uh, OA outreach and education, super important part of what we do. Um, and I want to note on this that the that IUS actually had the foresight to put to put together an incredibly powerful short film about um, ocean acidification, which focused on you know what was happening in those oyster hatcheries and what how they were responding to that. And it was a um, really good film, and I've shown it in many, many different forums, and, and it really just um, brings home the economic and cultural uh, uh, effects of oceanification. And so we're very um, happy to have had that partnership uh, with IUS and that they were able to put that together. So this is just a laundry list of how we partner with the um, integrated Ocean Observing System Regional Associations. Um, we leverage where we can the IUS observing assets. Um, we fund partnering p observing PIs through the regional associations, which has um, really strengthened our uh, reach. Uh, we've, the IUS RAs have been providing and augmenting logistical support for our observing assets, including our cruises. Um, they're providing real-time access to data. Um, we jointly fund um, technology development. Um, we've actually held joint workshops, including one in the Chesapeake Bay. And now we're doing these coastal acidification networks together. Um, if you heard Rue Morrison's talk, um, they're being very much the leads near Coos um, in the Northeast, as, as is Deb in the Southeast. Now I just want to make just a, a few, two minutes um, about this other global effort, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. Again, IUS is um, a huge partner in this effort, and I'm the um, co-chair of the Executive Council. And um, wanna, if you have not had a chance to check it out, go check out the website, www.goon.org, um, where you can get access to the recently released requirements and governance plan. 
Um, that's actually the lead the lead author of that is Jan Newton, who's the executive director of NANUS, um, the IUS RA on the West Coast. Um, there's an interactive map, um, and that is what I want to show you next. And then there's sort of general information about who's involved and network members and other documents. Um, and so this is actually you can go into that interactive map map and and zero in on a particular region. And so this is you know, maybe not all inclusive, but a lot of the platforms that are collecting OA information um, along the southeast, and I'm hoping any of you there who ha are collecting data and your information is not represented here, that you go on to the website and contact Kathy Koska and um, provide her with the information that she needs to make, make sure that that's represented here, and that mooring that looks like it's off Georgia, that's the Gray's Reef mooring, so the red are moorings and the green are tracked cruise lines or ships of opportunity and the blue are the big repeat hydrography lines. And the, the triangles are time series and I'm just going to show that if you mouse over any one of those um, you'll get this sort of metadata information. Eventually we hope that we could morph this map into uh, actually providing direct access to data, so stay tuned for that. Um, and I guess that's it. So I'm going to turn it over to Deborah, and then we'll take questions. Libby, I think while we're, uh, this is Paul, I think while we're switching over to Deborah, uh, there was one question specific to your uh, presentation from Roy He, and he wants to know if that East Coast Cruise data will become available in the public domain. Absolutely. Data, data access is one of our key operating principles. Um, I wouldn't, I would guess that it would be in the, there might be one iteration of it in the next couple of months. I mean, the, the plan is to make it accessible as, as quickly as possible. Um, Leticia Barbaro, um, who may be on the line as well, but is uh, at AOML, is uh, helping to manage the, the access to the data. So she would be the one likely to get in touch with. But eventually it'll be all available on um, NCEI, the National Co National Centers for Environmental Information, which is the new iteration of NODC, or the it's the no archive data archive. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, Deborah Hernandez, I think we're ready for your presentation. Great, thanks, Paula. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Fabulous. So, good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to present, and um, to Paula and Libby for the great um, introduction. So my presentation has two parts. I'm going to start by giving a basic introduction to Socora and IUS, and then in part two, I'll provide a discussion of SOCAN, how it was established, and what we're doing. So the Integrated Ocean Observing System is a federally mandated program, much like um, the Ocean Acidification Program, and I'd forgotten that we were both authorized um, initially in 2009. So um, like the OA program, the IUS program is fairly new, although it has about a decade of uh, history in advance of the federal legislation. But what we have now is this federal program and SCORE is one of 11 regional associations that are partnered to that program. The RAs have a lot in common, we share a lot of data um, and network on um, product development and we also share standards and protocols. So the foundational premise of IUS is that it's one system with multiple purposes, hence the collaboration with the OA program. But what you'll see um, by looking at these um, boxes in the middle are the types of, some of the types of observations 
and observational products that IU supports. And they can be used uh, to support commercial shipping. They can um, be extremely helpful in um, spill response activities. The Coast Guard uses the information um, regularly in search and rescue. The data is pulled into weather forecast and surge models to help improve um, our warning systems. Um, the data also is uh, foundational to understanding ecosystem dynamics. The longer term records um, increase our understanding of climate variability. And for anyone who's out on the ocean, including um, offshore energy developers, it helps improve our understanding of the state of the ocean. So Socora is um, the Southeast Regional Association, and you see our footprint there. We cover um, uh, from the North Carolina-Virginia state border um, all the way around uh, to the West Florida Shelf. And our mission is to support decision makers by collecting and synthesizing coastal and ocean data. And we also collaborate um, very often, as I've mentioned, with the other regional associations and especially the ones that border uh, the Socorro region to leverage opportunities and better understand our shared resources. Socorro is a membership-based nonprofit and we see our primary role as coordinating, facilitating, and instigating um, activities um, related to ocean observing and understanding and improving our decision making on the coast and ocean. So the Socorro staff is uh, relatively small. This is me up in the upper right. Um, with me in Charleston, South Carolina are Megan Lee, our business manager, and we have a part-time bookkeeper as well. And then in St. Petersburg, Vimbu Submarinian is our regional coastal ocean observing system manager, and he's joined there by Abby Wakeley, who's our communications specialist. We are governed by a 16-member board of directors, and you'll see there a list of our current board members. Their term started uh, July 1, so just a couple weeks ago. Conrad Lautenbacher, who some of you may know, is our current chairman. You'll see that um, our board represents um, a broad geography as well as sector diversity. Our bylaws actually require that. We have representatives from all four states and from uh, private industry, uh, the academic community, and uh, non-governmental organizations. You'll see here um, the logos of our members. We have about 45. Um, it includes some federal agency partners, including the Ocean Acidification Program, the National Marine Sanctuary Program, and then um, a number of academic institutions, some private sector folks, uh, the Georgia Aquarium, a pretty broad and diverse and um, productive group of individuals and entities. When I talk about what SECOR does, I'm representing the work of our members and our collective accomplishments, because certainly the staff um, uh, can only do a small part of the observing activity that occurs in our region. This is a quick picture of our annual budget. It happens to be uh, year five of our current cooperative agreement. You'll see that about 50%, I'm sorry, 57%, so Morden coastal stations and high frequency uh, radar, 57% um, of our funding goes to direct support of collection of observations. We also support data management communication to make sure the data is made available in real time if possible and uh, as quickly as possible through our website. We support modeling and then um, program development and outreach is our staff operations. This is another picture of Socorro by the numbers. We support about 15 radar and 21 in situ stations, so that's the moored and the coastal stations. You'll see that um, the, the, most of that work is accomplished by our um, principal investigators. And you'll note here some numbers related to um, how many um, people and uses of the observations are made. 
and all these numbers again are annual. I'll point out that one of the key things that the regional associations do is pull in non-federal data. Um, we um, help transform that data uh, so that it meets federal standards and can get ingested by NDBC and our national modeling centers to improve our collective understanding of the coast and ocean. This is a quick screenshot of those um, radar, which um, these are the footprints of the surface current radar. They change um, every uh, hour or two. Uh, you'll see we have in this day the current must have been moving really fast. I don't have the legend on here, but the warmer colors are the faster moving currents. So there are three radar up here off of northern North Carolina. We also have um, radar in southern North Carolina and the northern part of South Carolina. Some radar off of um, the Georgia coast, um, off of Miami, and then these aren't showing up very well, but also off the West Florida shelf. And then these bubbles are the moored stations that we support. And I've highlighted the um, OA buoy in Grace Reef Reserve. Um, or sorry, National Marine Sanctuary. Um, as Lemmy mentioned, funding for that site um, comes through Socora and has really helped um, strengthen our understanding of the work that's going on there and um, improved our partnership with the OA program. So just quickly, um, we don't collect data just for the sake of collecting data, although it certainly has some um, intrinsic value. We um, support some product development activities that use that data to help decision makers. In particular, in the ecosystem theme, we have a beach water quality model that provides advisories of um, the uh, whether it's safe to swim or not. It doesn't, however, um, have anything to say about whether sharks are around. That's the technology we've not yet developed. Um, you'll see in our climate change theme that um, we're supporting this uh, development of SOCAN, and we also um, support the long-term data collection um, and an analysis tool that gives folks a quick visualization about um, whether the current uh, parameters are within or outside of uh, the standard for uh, the parameter. We are supporting a RIP current forecast model project in cooperation with um, NOAA and the National Weather Service in particular to help validate their new RIP current model. And, um, we support a marine weather portal that's heavily utilized by the weather forecast offices and other mariners to get quick access to marine data. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk about SOCAN. This is the Southeast Ocean and Coastal Acidification Network. And Libby and I, I don't know, bumped into each other at a meeting probably about two years ago now and began to, I had questions about this, the impact or the understanding of ocean acidification in the southeast. And um, about a year ago, we had the lucky fortitude of having Paula Keener Chavis be on an IPA to the ocean acidification program. Paula sits in Charleston, so she was the perfect person to help get SOCAN kicked off. We had a, a pre-planning meeting a little over a year ago, um, got agreement from those who were involved that it would be valuable to uh, create a forum in the southeast. Um, it is modeled after the work in the northeast and in California. And we agreed that the goal should be to support and encourage um, discussions on ocean acidification in our region. So we, uh, like all good organizations, developed a mission statement. The full statement's on the website if you uh, want to read it in full. Um, you'll see that I've highlighted a few key points. We want to increase our baseline knowledge and understanding of OA. We want to provide a forum for discussions. 
we want to represent a broad range of stakeholders, so scientists as well as resource managers and business and industry. And then we have to find our region uh, for now to be the same as Socorro, so uh, pretty much North Carolina all the way uh, to Florida. This is our steering committee. It's 23 um, really bright um, and dedicated individuals. We're meeting monthly right now. You can find um, bios on all of um, our members on the website. Um, you'll see that uh, there's some diversity in expertise. We have those doing OA research, those who have more conservation and management responsibility. Um, Scott, who's operating the OA buoy in Graves Reef, and then the rest of us who represent industry, NGOs, and others with interest in ocean acidification and its potential impacts to resources in our region. This is our executive committee. They do a little bit of behind the scenes work in preparation for our steering committee. and. Um, they're the folks that get called on when we have to make quick decisions. Um, this has been a partnership early on. The Ocean Acidification Program and Socorro agreed to divide and conquer in terms of supporting the operations. There wasn't really any new funding that came um, our way to uh, get this effort instigated. So uh, the Ocean Acidification Program, Paula and Jen Mentz, they uh, manage the webinars and provide support to the steering committee. And on the Socorro side, we have um, a lead on more of the communications. Abby's done a wonderful job. She developed our um, logo as well as uh, is the architect of the web page maintains uh, the listserv and a number of other things to keep us on track and visible. Um, this is the website. It's at secor.org slash SOCAN. You can find um, some resource information, uh, as I mentioned, information about the steering committee and the mission of SOCAN as well as access to the listserv. So this, this is what we're doing. We're trying to publicize information about OA. We've um, got a listserv so folks can ask questions and can keep up to speed on what's happening. But our big accomplishment so far is the State of Science webinar series. And this is, I believe, the, the ninth um, in the series. They're held approximately every two weeks at, on Tuesdays at noon, and we are archiving all of the webinars so they can be a resource um, uh, to the entire community. So our short-term goal is to use the information learned from the webinars to develop a state of the science white paper on ocean acidification in the southeast. And you'll see here just the dates and the last names of our presenters. We do have a few more planned. Um, Roy He, who I think is on the webinar today, will be presenting on the 28th. We're also um, planning two panels that will have representatives from the management science and industry um, in our region. So our thought is to have one for the Carolinas, one for Florida and Georgia. The idea being to get their perspectives on OA and how it impacts um, or doesn't the resources and the um, work that they do. Uh, Emily Hall from Moat and Kim Yates with USGS will also be uh, making uh, presentations via webinar. And our target for an in-person meeting is in um, early to mid-January of 2016 when we expect to have the webinar series complete. And at that meeting, the goal will be to uh, have a state of the science report developed. This is um, just a slide of our first three webinars so you can get an idea of some of the topics that have been covered. And I encourage you, if you haven't 
um, participated yet or missed some of the webinars, so please just go to the website. It's really easy to take a quick listen. And I'm going to close uh, by announcing a new activity. We are um, hoping to begin to communicate broadly uh, different activities of relevance um, to ocean acidification in our region. So we're going to have um, on the website uh, this form, and if you're collecting data related to ocean acidification, if you've published a paper or are undertaking some other communication activity, if you'll submit a little bit of information to us, we will publish it on the website, um, send it out via the listserv, and try to broaden um, our understanding and knowledge about what's happening in the region. And I believe this is my last slide, and I think I'm on time. This is the web address again, and I will stop there so we have time to take questions if there are any. Yes, thank you very much, um, Libby and uh, Deborah, for those wonderful presentations. and. Uh, so um, just for uh, Jen, I think you got my message that my computer is going to restart in about two minutes. I don't know whether that's true or not, but stand by in case it does. But I want to just um, let's, let's open it up to the audience for some questions. And um, I'll also say that, that we, are, we are exploring um, uh, future topics for webinars as well. So if you have any ideas there, uh, we'd be happy to, to take those um, those ideas for future topics for webinars. So um, I'm looking in our questions box. While we're waiting for the questions, can you all hear me? Yes, Libby. Okay. I just wanted to, um, since I have it sitting here on my desk, point out to folks who are listening that um, the, one of the newest issues, I guess it's maybe still the newest issue of Oceanography, um, just came out in late June, is entirely focused on ocean acidification. It's called Emerging Themes in Ocean Acidification Science. You can get it. It's all publicly accessible. You can get the whole issue um, online, or you can write to me and I can send you a hard copy. We have a few hard copies. So I just want to encourage people to check that out. OK, thank you, Libby. I don't I, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I said not a lot of questions coming in. No, no, they're not. But I'll, I'll post the. The, the uh, question from our end again, um, do, do you, oh, someone asked if you could repeat what you just said, Libby, I'm assuming oh. that supplementary issue of oceanography. So maybe, uh, I'm wondering if I could put it in the chat box too, or maybe Jen, if you want to go look for that. The, the most recent issue of oceanography journal, the, um, put out by the Oceanography Society, is uh, entirely focused on ocean acidification. So it's the name of the, the issue is Emerging Themes in OA Science. Can you still hear me? Let's see. I don't know what that sound is. Um, and there, it actually grew out of the US Ocean Acidification uh, Principal Investigators meeting, which happened in September 2012. Yeah. So anyway, that's I hope hope people will have a chance to look at that. Yeah, and there's the if you look in the chat box, you'll see the link. Sounds like Paula might have been kicked off. <laughs> Deborah, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay. Well, can you maybe, hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Maybe if we don't have any questions, I'm not seeing anything. Um, we'll close it up. I'm guessing that Paula might have gotten bumped. 
Libby, right. Deborah, I do have um, one question for you, just, um, and, and this there may or not be an answer, but um, do you all sort of have any visions um, for the future as far as, you know, we saw some of the, the places they're monitoring, um, currently being monitored, but are there ideas moving forward? And I'll leave that pretty open. Well, so, uh, you know, obviously part of it is resource dependent, and um, one thing that we've seen happen in, in other regions is that uh, we're seeing increasing, increasingly more actions taken by the states as well. So um, Washington State and Oregon actually are putting some of their hard-earned budget towards ocean acidification monitoring. Similar thing uh, may be happening in Maine. And so, you know, who knows, uh, maybe the southeast will, uh, states, governments will get active. But um, on a separate note, if you go back to the NOAA, NOAA Ocean Acidification Plan, we actually laid out, again, that was 2010, so we have to revisit it carefully. But we did lay out a series of um, NOAA uh, mooring locations that could be potentially good locations, and a couple of those in, are in the southeast, one being off Cape Hatteras, another Pamlico Sound, another off Tampa Bay, and another one in the Everglades. Um, so we will likely be looking for input from the community um, for particularly good sort of locations for, for moorings. Um, we definitely want, the NOAA program would like to see expansion in the research that NOAA does broadly on biological impacts for uh, species in the region, as I noted before. Um, and yeah, so I think I'll leave it at that. So we're exploring those, and, and really this SOCAN effort, in my opinion, the state of the science is going to be really helpful um, to help us identify where the gaps are. And um, so the more participation we have um, or at least input through the members who will be attending that, um, it, the better. Great, thank you. Um, so we do have a question. Anna is curious if anyone is looking at the sea bottom chemistry, for example, buffering capacity or the amount of calcium carbonate in sediment that's associated with ocean acidification. Hmm. Um. Scott Noakes does have sensors on the seafloor at the um, Grace Reef buoy, but I don't know to what extent he's, I don't think he's investigating buffering capacity. But if Scott's on, I, I can't remember if I saw him or not. Yeah. He, he might could elaborate. Yeah, I mean, there's, um, I mean, that's an interesting question. I'm sure um, that particularly the National Science Foundation and, and they have done a large investment in oceanification research that there have got to be projects that involve looking at um, sort of sediment cycling and um, I mean I know I almost can picture it but I can't remember who would be working on it uh, looking at saturation state as you actually go down into the sediments um, because I know that the water the pH actually drops as you go down as there's less oxygen more CO2 um, but I, I don't know if that's a question. If we're thinking about just measurements in subsurface waters, uh, part of that has been limited by the technologies that we have available. Um, but that technology development is happening fairly quickly, and we hope soon. Actually, the X Prize is about to announce um, the winners of their prize for development of deep water pH sensors. Um, that could actually be deployed at moorings and have high levels of accuracy and precision and easy to use. And um, so stay tuned for that. But we hope that soon we'll have a good suite package or a suite of sensor package that we can deploy in deep waters. Because I think, you know, deep waters is obviously where and near the bottom is where a lot of organisms live. Great, and Anna is, is having a conversation with her. She's she's is thinking about um, areas where oyster and coral reefs grow, so the variance right. among sites and identifications right. of areas less vulnerable to OA. Um, so yeah, another important 
important things to think about, particularly for the Southeast. Um, right. So, yeah, and Anna, we open it up to you. If you are aware of any work going on in this region, <laughs> you have the, the opportunity to go ahead and, and either contact Deb or, or Libby or add it to that activities page mm -hmm. that, um, that Deborah mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I will, I'll mention one other thing, which is that Kim Yates, who's on our steering committee, um, works for USGS and does a lot of work in coral reefs, and they've developed some interesting um, interesting technology for, you know, sort of enclosing a part of the reef and then looking at net calcification for an entire community. And that, that is sort of getting at, I think, the, the questions that, that Anna is probably asking. Great. Um, so we'll just give it, um, yes, huge. thanks to Anna. Um, so um, we'll just give it another if anyone else has any lingering questions, um, please go ahead and type them in. And um, we will go ahead and just give you um, the contact information for both um, Libby and Deborah as well. And I, I um, believe that Paula has rejoined us. So Paula, would you like to, to close us out? It doesn't look like there are any further questions. Sure, I'll be happy to. And I've got the slides back up on the screen. So uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Libby and Deborah again for this fantastic presentation. And um, thank you all for the questions that you posed to us. And uh, our, if we didn't get to any of your questions or if you think of questions later, um, please feel free to contact either Libby or Deborah directly via their emails, um, or you can contact um, the SOCAN network to get um, get uh, get that information to us and um, we can um, we'll be happy to to get the questions to either Libby or or Deborah for the answer um, thank you for attending the webinar today uh, we welcome any feedback uh, further questions or suggestions for topics for this webinar series and uh, you can submit input by replying to the following um, following email you'll receive from us after the webinar today. And the recording of this webinar, as I stated in the beginning, and a PDF of the presentation will be available on the SOCAN website. And I have no idea with my computer crashing and getting ready for or getting updated <laughs> without my knowing it, um, whether you're able to see my slides or not at this point in time. So I'm just going to advance. Um, my slide and hope that everybody can see it. Our next State of the Science discussion will be held two weeks from today on Tuesday, July 28th, and Roy He um, from North Carolina State University will be, will be discussing modeling ocean circulation and biogeochemical variability in the southeastern United States coastal ocean and Gulf of Mexico at noontime. We hope that you'll be able to join us. Thanks again to Libby and Deborah for their very informative presentations and to all of you for taking the time to be with us this afternoon and your thoughtful questions. We hope to see you at SOCAN's next State of the Science conversation. This ends the webinar session.